We have started our series with some general information and study on the concept of doctrine and biblical truth and what that is. And then we had a look at the Bible and what the Bible is as the Word of God. And tonight we want to have a look at what the Scripture says in regards to how the Bible was actually written. All right, how was the Bible written is the question. So if the Bible is the Word of God, and this is what we've been studying and having a looking at, so how did it get to us? How did God communicate His Word? So if we have a look at the Scriptures, we know that um, God wrote only three times that we know of in the Word of God. That means He Himself, by His own finger, if you please, in His own handwriting, if you like, only wrote three times. And these are the three actual instances that we know of. The first one was uh, the Ten Commandments, and they were written on stone. Who remembers the occasion that when this took place? Yes, Casey. Right? Very good. Okay, okay, so and we know that somehow, although God has no finger, somehow he wrote it in stone, and he actually carved it in tables of stone, which he handed to Moses. So we know that God actually wrote that himself, and uh, that's the reference, if you're taking notes there, uh, in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. And God actually wrote in stone. And another instance, we know that he wrote a judgment message or a message of judgment. And this was on Belshazzar's wall. If you remember, Belshazzar was the king that succeeded, or the son of, and successor of Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had learned a few lessons about respecting God and having humility before God and so forth. But his son obviously forgot those lessons. And what he did, he went and actually took all of the vessels, the golden vessels and the vessels that had been dedicated to the service of God, to the service of the temple. And he desecrated them by using them in a party, or more appropriately in some kind of orgy that he was running. And uh, the fact is the judgment came very, very quickly upon him. And a finger, the finger of God, wrote on the wall you can imagine the scene here. If you could just picture it for a moment, there's all the partying and reveling and so forth going on, and so much so at the expense of God and, and, and things that were precious to God. And the finger of God came and wrote a message of judgment. Does anybody remember what the message was in this case? Yes. And found wanting. Yeah, meeny, meeny, tikel, you parsim. And when it was translated by, uh, by Daniel, it meant... You've been weighing the balances and found wanting. And pretty soon after that, the kingdom was taken from this man and another man uh, took over. So, you know, we need to be careful of those things that are precious to God. And uh, God saw this to be urgent enough and pressing enough, just like when he wrote the commandments that were to direct his people, and in this particular case, pressing enough to bring judgment and to show us that things that are consecrated to him should be remain consecrated to Him and not used for other things. What does that tell you about you as a person? If you've been consecrated to God and your life has been given to Him and you've made a commitment for Jesus, what does that say about your commitment, you see? God wants what you are committed to Him to remain committed to Him. When we begin to desecrate that which is God's and we use it for other purposes, well, judgment can come very quickly. I think it's an interesting a concept and a very important time that God wrote. The third time that God wrote was a time when men was judging in this case. And in fact, if you remember, this was when Jesus wrote. And in this case, it was on the floor, on the dirt of the floor of the temple, if you please, on the sand that was out there. Does anybody remember the circumstances of this writing? Yeah, Mr. Bernie. Right. Okay, and nobody could, right? So we know that this woman was married. She was caught in adultery in the very act, the scripture says. And they brought her to Jesus to see what he would do. The law stated that a woman caught in adultery, or a man caught in adultery for that matter, should be stoned to death. And so Jesus said, okay, well, you want the law fulfilled? Okay, well, him among you that has no sin, let him cast the first stone. You, you begin the process. That's a fair call, isn't it? And then he sort of looked down and began to write in the, in the floor of the dirt of the temple. Now, we don't know what he wrote in this particular instance. We know what he wrote in the other two instances, 
we don't know what he wrote here, but by the time he was finished writing and he lifted his eyes again, all of those accusers had gone. And the woman was sent away, not without a caution. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Jesus didn't justify her sin or say, oh, it's okay. You've got away with it this time. He said, go and sin no more. They did not condemn you, neither condemn I. And Jesus could have cast the first stone, as you know, because he had no sin. He did not cast a stone. He forgave her and encouraged her to go and not sin any longer. So, these are the three instances that we know from the Scriptures where God Himself wrote any message, per se. So, how can we call the Bible the Word of God, considering that God Himself didn't write it? And I guess this is really the greatest objection that many that don't believe in God have to the Word of God. They say, well, if it's God's Word, why didn't He write it? Okay, so how was the Bible written is really the question and uh, it's a question we wish to answer tonight. It was written in this manner. Now let's read this sentence together because you'll understand a lot more about it tonight if you haven't today. It was written by plenary verbal inspiration communicated by revelation and illumination. Okay, now it was specifically written by... Say these words with me, will you? Plenary verbal inspiration it was communicated by revelation and through illumination god made it understood to man okay and we'll kind of, kind of cover these terms tonight so in your notes there if you, if you got your little note that you received jot down uh, the information because it will come in handy i know that most of you have been through this material before but i think it's good to review because at times we're asked questions aren't we we need to be able to give correct answers and biblical answers answers that will hold up. All right then, so let's define uh, some of the terms here tonight. First of all, plenary. That's the statement that we've made. Plenary, verbal inspiration. Plenary means just that. Full, complete, entire, absolute, without doubt, nothing left out. Uh, that means that we believe in the full inspiration of the Scriptures. So how was the Bible written? Uh, it was written by full, plenary, complete inspiration of God. That's one of the first points that we make in the definition of how it was written. Remember that God didn't have to write the entire Bible with His own hand, as it were, in order to be the Word of God. And that's what we'd like to demonstrate tonight. So, so for those critics of the Scriptures out there that say, oh, well, you know, if it's the Word of God, then why didn't God write it Himself? It was written by man, so it's only a man's book. We uh, beg to differ big time. The Bible was written by plenary verbal inspiration. Plenary meaning full, complete inspiration. Okay? Verbal, of course, meaning what? Every single word was inspired of God. Not just merely a word here and there, but every single word. What we'd like to just sort of take a little longer on this definition because this is particularly important. What it means is that every word, and please understand what I'm saying here, in the original writing was inspired of God. Every word was given in the original writings by God. So, perhaps in translating from the original language into another language, the translators may well have made some errors. They may well have mistranslated some things. But in the original writings that were inspired by God, there are no mistakes. There can be no mistakes. It's the Word of God. It's what God said. And that's what God calls men to write. So there cannot be any errors in it. God doesn't make mistakes. I want to stress here that it wasn't, it wasn't just the thought. Some people think that when God inspired, He inspired in the same manner that you and I get inspiration. Do you sometimes get inspiration? Mums, sometimes you get inspiration about a meal you're going to cook. What happens when... Can, can a mum tell me what happens when you get inspiration about a meal? What happens? What happens? Like, yeah, where does it happen? First of all. You're pointing to it, what's it mean? In the thoughts, right? Ah, oh, I could do... And then it's there, isn't it? The thoughts, you're inspired. Maybe you've seen a recipe or you've heard something or or perhaps an individual gets an idea, inspired, and the thoughts are there and he begins to think about writing a book based on that thought. Uh, you might get, if you're, if you're a painter or an artist in some way, you might get an inspiration about some painting you will do and you'll think it and it'll happen in your mind and that thought... It's a sort of an inspiration. 
Well, what we want to point out is that the Word of God was more than just inspired thought. That's important. Because what happens to thoughts when you have to write them down and put them down as words? What happens? Yeah. Okay, it, well, it, it, it's subject to interpretation, isn't it? But in, other, in other words, between thoughts which are up here and they're kind of intangible and they're not necessarily structured and what actually comes out in words and expression is quite a difference. Have you ever felt that you know what you want to say but you can't quite put it into words? Well, that's what I'm talking about. There's a, quite a distinction between the thoughts and the words. So when we talk about plenary or full, verbal inspiration of God's Word, we're saying that God actually gave the words. Okay? He gave the very words, not merely the thoughts that were translated into words. If only the thoughts were given, then the Bible would contain the Word of God, but it wouldn't be, in essence, the Word of God itself. We couldn't call it the Word of God. Because it would be the Word of God through the thoughts of man. Thoughts that were inspired, perhaps, but it would be their expression of those thoughts. But not so. We believe that the Word of God is verbally inspired, and as such, is in essence, the Bible is in essence the Word of God. So when people tell you, oh, well, yeah, okay, so God gave them some ideas and they just made the words up, that is an error. The Bible was verbally inspired, and we'll try and look at some of the evidences for this tonight. So we believe absolutely in the full, plenary, verbal, and then the next word, of course, is inspiration of the Word of God. And, of course, we are somewhat familiar with the concept of being inspired, as we've just discussed, but this is a special inspiration. This is not just an inspiration that you got while you were listening to somebody on a cooking show and, and, you know, and you thought, oh, that's a great idea, and you were inspired by it. We have a different take on the word inspiration. This word inspiration literally means breathed by God. And it comes from a Greek word that means exactly that. Theopnestos literally means God breathed out. And as he breathed it out, he breathed it into the mind and the heart of that man that was to write. So you see, it's a different level of inspiration. It is an inspiration that comes directly from God. It is literally His breath, His very life, if you please, in the mind and the heart of the writer. It is the strong, conscious inbreathing of God into man, qualifying them to write and utter the truth. Literally, God speaking through man, if you like. Now, what is beautiful about this is that only God can inspire in this manner. Another man can't inspire in this manner, only God can. And when it comes to the Bible, God took time, although He didn't write it with His own hand like He did in those first three instances, uh, every detail that is in your Bible, and certainly in the original language that we're referring to, God spoke, as it were, in a full, verbal, inspired manner and breathed it, as it were, by His Spirit through individuals. This is a process that only God can bring about. Holy men of God, says Evans, one of the uh, Bible commentators, were kept qualified by divine command and were kept from all error, whether they revealed truths previously unknown or recorded truths already familiar. Okay, so are we clear on that? Plenary is full. Verbal means every single word. And inspiration. God breathed literally through these individuals. And there are some very interesting things about this process that doesn't necessarily always involve a full conscious comprehension by the person that's being inspired. And we'll cover that in a moment. But before we do, let me define a couple more terms for you. Are we clear on these? Any questions on these? Okay. So then, the next couple of terms I'd like you to have clear is the term revelation. Let me explain the difference. There are two terms here that we have to work together in order for God to communicate and then for us to understand that communication. It's a bit like this. You know how you've got a, the radio station that sends out a signal? Okay? That signal is kind of an airwave. Would you say that signal is out there? It's sent out, right? It's being put out by the radio station. But how do you receive it? How do you make it comprehensible to you? How do you translate that signal into something that you comprehend? What do you use? A radio. You tune into that station, and as you tune into that station, it kind of translates the waves into sounds that you can comprehend. 
So the transmission is one thing, the reception is another. Is that clear? That's pretty important because revelation is the transmission. Revelation is the act by which God directly communicates truth that may not have been known before. So man may never have understood this stuff before. He may never have come across it before. <coughs> and chances are that he hasn't because God has revealed it to mankind. The Bible is God's revelation to man. So if you please, many people have the message going out there, the waves going out. A lot of people have a Bible, right? But does just have a Bible mean that you understand the message of God? Quite clearly, that's not the case. So what do we need? Here's what we need. And this is the act of the Holy Spirit on our minds to help us comprehend what God has communicated. So revelation is the message that God sends out and has made available to everybody. Please understand the Word of God has been revealed to how many men? All of mankind. It is for everybody. It's like the waves are out there. But it is not until we can tune in, as it were, with our little radio or our little unit for translation, as it were. And this is the process by which the Holy Spirit of God influences the minds of man to be able to comprehend and understand spiritual truth. Uh, and this is the truth that God has already revealed. So it is possible for a person to have a Bible, which is the message of God, the revelation from heaven. And yet still not understand what God is saying to that person. And, and it's so very sad to see that unfortunately in a lot of cases that's exactly what we're faced with today. It isn't a shortage of Bibles any longer, it is a shortage of illumination or, or of yielding to the action of the Spirit of God. Let me add one thing here that illumination possibly cannot take place until you and I yield and give over to the Spirit of God. Okay, so, are we clear on the distinction here? When, Brother Robert, yep. Yep. Yes. Right. Yes. If, if there was any other revelation of God, it would have to have been included in the Word of God. Because otherwise, we would have no way of measuring it. So, in other words, let's assume that somebody comes up to you and says, I have a revelation from God, right? And what they bring to you is not found in the revealed Word of God, the Word of God. Now, according to Scripture, you have no way of measuring it. You have no way of evaluating it. So, you cannot accept that as revealed Word of God. But anyone that says to you, I have a revelation, they mean an illumination, and it is a reflection of what the Word of God does teach, then you have a way of measuring and say, well, that lines up with the Scriptures, or no, it does not. So, if you please, outside of what is the revealed Word of God, we're talking what is God's will for man. I'm talking revealed as in that which is spiritually revealed. We're talking spiritual truth here. Now, please understand that outside of spiritual truth, God has revealed a whole lot more. If we're talking, for instance, in the scientific field, or in so, there are, there's so much more that God has revealed and has opened up, and God has allowed, if you please, men to discover and to find out. This is revealed still, because when God has created and has put it there, it's a message to you and I, isn't it? It's revealed. And all it, all it means is really that we have to yet interpret it and understand it and comprehend it. But at a spiritual level, the only way that we can comprehend spiritual truth is to have the revealed Word of God and then to have the Holy Spirit act on our minds so that we can comprehend the message of that revealed will. Okay, is that fairly clear? So, in other words, if ever you are believing something or come up with some amazing thought that you believe is from God and you cannot line it up with the Scripture or it goes against the Word of God, that is not illumination from God. You can quite easily dismiss it and put it out and and remove it because unless it aligns with the Word of God, we cannot evaluate it as correct and being true. Can you see why we can determine that which is of truth and that which is of error? Ultimately, the Word of God becomes a final judgment in any man's opinion or any man's, well, revelation, illumination, or whatever they may want to call it. All right, so please 
Let's comprehend this. God has revealed His Word, and in His Word is all that He wants us to understand about what is spiritual. Spiritual truth. So, would you, would you agree, therefore, that all of the Word of God is truth? Isn't that what the Scripture says? Thy Word is truth, right? Therefore, all of the Word of God is doctrine. If it's truth, it's teaching. Now, we've agreed in our first lesson that not all doctrine is essential to salvation. We understand that too. Some doctrine is just simply for information and certainly may help us understand one thing or another, but it's not essential to salvation. It doesn't necessarily reflect on our salvation. So, in other words, if you didn't know that there were going to be 144,000 selected in, in Revelation and who they are, is that going to upset the way that you're going to make it into heaven? or that you're going to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Spirit? Is it essential to you, for you to know that in order to be saved? It's not, right? Nevertheless, it is biblical doctrine. Some biblical doctrine is essential to salvation, applies to everybody, whereas other doctrine and teaching and truth applies to some people, not others. Some people in certain tasks or in certain positions. If you're a dad, the Lord speaks a great deal to dads about how to run their families. If you're a mom, the same way. If you're a child, Right? But if you're not a mom or a dad, if you don't have those responsibilities, chances are that those doctrines or those teachings don't yet apply to you at this time. I guess what we're saying is, though, that in order to understand whatever God has communicated to us through His Word, we need the Holy Spirit. We need God's mind to reveal it to us, or God's Spirit to reveal it to our minds and illuminate it. It's like God switches the light on and we comprehend. Now, who's had this experience? You've read a scripture many times, right? And you've read it, and then this particular day you read it, and it's like the light goes on. And now you comprehend. Now you see something more. Now you, you can go deeper. It's like the lights came on. Illumination. And it does speak about life going on in our hearts, in our souls. These two processes, along with the fact that God has inspired this word in the first place, make certain that we, God can communicate to our hearts and that we can comprehend what He is saying. Now this is why it was so important, by the way, to translate the Word of God in, langu in a language that we could understand. Can you appreciate the work that those translators did to bring it to you and I in English? And yes, okay, there may be some flaws and some defects in the translations, but let me tell you, it has allowed us to be acted upon by the Spirit of God and be illuminated and then seek back to the original language to be able to comprehend what God is saying to me. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so revelation and illumination. Everyone clear on these definitions? Okay, they're pretty important. So, plenary, verbal, inspiration. That's that's how God has written his, the book. Okay, that's how the Bible was written. And then it is communicated by revelation. So, revelation is this act of God. And then it is made understood by to the human mind through illumination, which is the act of the Holy Spirit on our minds. This is why, by the way, when you read the Bible, you should do so prayerfully. You shouldn't just take it for granted or skim over. You should stop and pause and meditate and let the Spirit of God speak to you. Somebody said meditation, a prayer is when we talk to God. Meditation is when we listen what God says to us. Well, meditation is really waiting on God to illuminate our minds about what His Word says. Isn't that what you do when you meditate? You take time over the Word. You kind of wait on God and wait on His Spirit. And you say, Lord, what does this mean? And you look at another verse that may be in, in, in conjunction with it. And, and you let the Holy Ghost build that faith and that doctrine in your soul. Okay, so illumination. And uh, God can uh, teach you and show you a great deal if you allow Him by His Spirit to speak to you. All right then, well... These are the reasons why we believe in the full or plenary inspiration of the Bible. Now, I'm going to go through fairly quickly with these. There are a number of scriptures. We may look at some of them, but I would ask you to jot them down and read them at home just for the sake of time tonight. There are many, many reasons, and we've only listed a few, and I'm only asking you to list a few in your own little uh, note there if you want to just uh, jot down three or four just to remind you as to why we are firm believers in the full verbal inspiration of the Bible. So, the reasons for the full inspiration, first up, let's have a look at those. Okay? Firstly, the Bible itself says so. Let's turn up these two verses. If you've got 2 Timothy uh, 3 and 16, put your hand up and let me see it. Please, Grace, if you can read it out loud. Yeah.
Okay, now we've just stated that we believe that uh, all of the Bible is fully inspired, and the Scripture says here that all Scripture, how much? All Scripture is given by what? And notice what inspiration, inspiration of God, it says. Okay, so we are talking about this God breathing that we, that we were referring to before. God literally breathed it out. How much Scripture? All Scripture. And then it tells you that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So in other words, there's no portion of the Word of God that one can dismiss and say, ah, oh, well, you know, that's not profitable. Now, if you will listen to the Spirit of God, God will show you how it is profitable to something in some way in your life. Now, I admit that there are some portions you may read that are, seem a little bit more difficult than others, but the fact is all Scripture, according to the Word of God, has been given by inspiration of God and is profitable. If you remember, we looked at that word, and it is a word that in another portion of Scripture, it's rendered as expedient. Do you remember that word expedient in the, in the epistles? It says, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. Well, that's the same word. It means profitable. And so, all word of God is expedient. There's some good in it. There's something that builds us up. Okay, so, the Bible itself says so. Would you agree? It says, all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let's have a look at Second Peter 1, 20, 21. Please, uh, Brother Bill. Yeah. Knowing his word, Praise God. If you remember, we had that as portion of our study in the second uh, epistle of Peter. And it says that it's not for private interpretation. And these men didn't speak of their own accord, but they spoke as God's Spirit moved upon them, meaning literally God breathed upon them, God inspired them by this method that we have just described, God's breath literally through them. When you think about it, we really, in a sense, reflect that process in a natural sense every time we speak. Think about what happens when we utter words. What happens? We breathe, right? And then we bring out sound, and we, as we breathe out, I guess our vocal cords vibrate, but it is a breathing or an air through those vocal cords that make the sounds. Would you agree? This is what happens. We kind of breathe out the words. So those words we hear because our vocal cords translate the, uh, through vibrations the sounds of the breathing out as we speak. That, in a sense, is exactly, in a spiritual sense, what God does through men when he breathes out, when he inspires the Word of God. These men, and those of you that are used at times in tongues or interpretation or in prophecy, know that this, this message just comes from God. It's like there's just something within you that you just have to speak out. Well, even more so, in this sense, God specifically breathed it out and made a record of it for our benefit. So we believe in the full inspiration of the Bible because the Bible itself says so. But there are many other reasons, among which this one, which is a particularly important one. Somebody find Matthew 5 and 18. This verse of scripture on its own, by the way, is a, is a big backstop, is an important scripture, and you'll see it come up again and again in all of our explanations as to the Word of God. Brother Peter, out loud, if you will. But verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Along with another scripture in Psalms, which we'll read throughout the study, you'll find that God says that His Word is eternal. It's there to stay. So it's not going to pass away. Now, you have seen books come and go. Even the most important books have been superseded. Even the most amazing manuals of knowledge and technology have always been somehow superseded. And yet here is a book that was written so many thousands of years ago and over a long period of time by so many individuals and yet it is still current to this day. It's not superseded. It's never going to be superseded because the author is God who knows the end from the beginning. And what he inspired men to write was what he knew would apply to every generation of humanity, every nationality and, and descendants of men, and in every possible circumstance. So when people tell you that the Bible is archaic, it's no longer in touch with reality, and so forth, they are in gross error. And you can tell them, God's word says otherwise. Jesus said otherwise. He gave full sanction 
to the Old Testament and he said it's not going to pass away, it is current for today. Here is another reason why we believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. The prophecies of the Bible stamp it as divine. Now, this has been tested not by Christians as much as by those that are not Christians. They have equated the prophecies of many so-called uh, prophets and divines and seers along with those of the scriptures. The Bible prophecies have been found to be incredibly accurate and consistently so. Only God can see the end from the beginning and only God can reveal and therefore inspire men to write things they could not possibly know about. And so when you look at uh, this particular aspect, let's read First Peter 1, 10 and 11. You'll find that the prophecies in itself stamp it as divine. Please, Brother Peter, out loud. All right, praise the Lord. These writers prophesied of the sufferings of Christ, and they weren't teaching themselves. They were actually speaking to us about things they knew nothing about. And this was actually prophesying for our benefits of the salvation that would come to us. They didn't understand the salvation we have experienced, but and so it wasn't for them, but they prophesied that it would come through Christ. And if you read the prophecies of Isaiah, for instance, 700 years before Jesus was even born, he spoke about someone that would be born of a virgin, that, that would die, and, and whose countenance would be totally ruined by the suffering that he would have for you and I. And then the prophecies become so specific as to mention the very place he's born, the conditions of his birth, and all of the conditions of his dying, and even the nature of his death long before crucifixion was even invented. Amazing, huh? And uh, just on that topic alone, one could spend a great deal of time to show that the prophecies of the Bible stamp it as divine, for only God could have known the end from the beginning, therefore revealed it to man, and what men wrote verbally was the full message of the inspiration of God. God breathed it. No other book stands the test of prophetic accuracy like the Bible does. Okay, many other reasons, but I'm trying to move quickly through them. The moral standards of the Bible prove it to be divine. If you read in that same chapter in verse 16, it says, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. No other book anywhere makes such a statement and commands man, humanity, to be holy because it's God is holy. The moral standards of the Bible were used by most governments in the Western world to set up their laws and the relationships in societies and communities. The family was built by using the standards and the morality of the Word of God. The fact that today man has abandoned much of this morality doesn't take away from the fact that the morality of the Bible stamps it as divine, makes it and proves it as a divine record, God's way of doing things, and something that you and I, of course, should uphold. More reasons for why. It reveals the only way of salvation, so plain, and yet so deep. Did you know that there is no other book that even remotely attempts or can possibly explain how to be saved? You try it, if you will. Ask a Buddhist, what is the way to salvation? How do you be, how do you be saved? And their explanation, if they even have one, is so complex and so convoluted that they don't know really the way of salvation. And so only in the Bible do we find direct statements as to what saves, who saves, and how we can be saved. Can somebody remember what Romans 6.23 says? For the wages of... Is what? Yeah. So, straight away, God in His Word says, and it's fairly straightforward, it says, if you sin, you're going to die. But then He adds this beautiful context. He says, but the gift of God is what? Eternal of light. Through whom? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, you see, there is a, a way of salvation. God tells you that, that sin brings forth death, but He also tells you how you can escape that death and have life eternal. And of course, that's just one verse of many that explain the beauty and simplicity of God's Word. And then if you look at it, Romans 11.33, you'll find that the Word of God itself tells you how it is deep and unsearchable, and in that sense, really, has to be revealed of God. In fact, let's read that verse together. Because what we have stated here is that it is plain and yet deep. And it's true 
the Apostle Paul to the Romans says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So in other words, what he is saying is with our natural mind, we don't stand a chance of comprehending what God is saying. And have you noticed that so many people who are not either Holy Ghost filled or certainly do not want to yield to the leading of God's Spirit, do not comprehend the Word of God? All they can do is make fun of it. All they can do is pull it down. It's only through the Spirit of God that we can have this understanding and illumination. And so, in the natural, His ways are past finding out. But once we step into the spiritual realm and we allow the illumination of God's Spirit, then we begin to comprehend, at least have glimpses of what God is communicating to us. It's like we finally are able to tune into the right station of the waves of God's truth and revelation. Praise the Lord. Okay then. Here's another reason. The Bible will outlast the universe. And we have looked at those scriptures in Matthew 5 and 18, and we'll read Psalm 119 in a moment. Here's another reason. It is a product of one mastermind, one author, though written by 40 men over 1,600 years. So what we understand is that although many men in different walks of lives, from different countries, from different societies, wrote and penned the actual words, those words were inspired by God Himself, which makes Him the author. And it is so precise that in spite of the fact that most of these writers never met each other, they never knew each other, they never communicated to each other, yet what they wrote about is always consistent. There's a beautiful tenor of doctrine from the old to the new, consistently linked, and not one of them says something different about God or about the truths of God than another. Why is that? Well, God wove it all together from the beginning, to the end. Isn't that beautiful? God is the author, and in that, and that is another reason why we believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. Here is another that we could spend a great deal of time on, but let me just touch on it to say that the types, the symbols, the ceremonies, and a whole great deal more reveal it as divine. For instance, if you study uh, the symbolisms of Christ as found in the tabernacle, it is mind-boggling the detail that the Spirit of God went to to show the type and then the fulfillment of that type in Christ. It is just amazing. It is, it is truly something that, you know, from a human standpoint, is just impossible. But in God's mind, it's not that difficult. And He has presented this and revealed it. The funny part is that the person that was writing about the tabernacle and how many pillars and, and the fact that there was some caps of silver and, and so many layers of this and so on, never understood any of the of the uh, the in interpretation or the meaning of what he was writing or what they were doing. They were simply following what God said to do. But coming from this end, when we have an understanding and a revelation and an illumination of God, we can comprehend and see the types and shadows. Hallelujah. And so for this reason also, we believe in the full inspiration of God. For any man to have written by, by himself any portion of the Bible without God's inspiration, they would have had to have had everybody else's writing first, readily available, studied it thoroughly, and then carefully tried to comply with the, the thoughts and ideas that were already there. And clearly that is not how the Bible came together. And so, even those that study these things in detail will tell you that the world recognizes it as divine. Now, it's sad that in the last 30 to 50 years there has been a, a great change of opinion towards the Word of God as Christians themselves have abandoned the purity and absolutes of the Bible, then the world, of course, has also abandoned the idea that God has a book, that God has ordained this book, and it is for our good. But it always used to be known as the good book. Even by those that didn't believe necessarily, they used to say, oh, well, the good book says... And it's almost, almost anybody knew something about the good book and what it said. It was read in schools. It was quoted by parents. It was used as an, as an aspect of discipline as well as of law. It was actually at the core of much of the co commerce and how commerce was actually c conducted. And so the good book always broke good things and still does for those that believe and uphold it. But for those that don't believe in it, of course, they don't get any benefit from it. Sadly, uh, many people do use some of the principles that are in the good book, but they turn it to their own advantage without giving glory to the author 
and the finisher of the faith. In any case, more than any other book, this is the book translated in more languages than any other book in the world. I am told that it has been translated in every language under the sun, and now they're translating it in, in most dialects, and at least the New Testament or portions of it has already been translated that way. I believe God wants His Word to be given to everybody. Amen? And on top of that, whole libraries have been written to interpret and explain. And so literally, from just this miniature library that we carry around with us, there are just huge libraries. I mean, who's got, for instance, a commentary? Have you seen... You know what I'm talking about. If you've ever seen something called a pulpit commentary, have a look at it. You're talking, you know, more than a dozen or more books of fine print, of just you know, explanation. That's just one set of books that have been written on the book. Literally entire libraries have been written and penned by men in explanation, in comments, because it is just an inexhaustible source of thought and understanding and teaching and illumination. And what one man is seen, another may not have. And so there is just so much beauty that can come from what God reveals and illuminates the mind of man from the revelation He's given us. So, for all of these reasons and much more, we believe that the Bible is fully, plenary, inspired of God. I'd like to just quickly take some time as we close today to show you also some reasons why we believe it is verbally inspired. Now, remember we, we said our definition was that it is fully, verbally inspired. Okay, we've covered some reasons why we believe it is fully inspired. Let's have a look quickly at some of the reasons why we believe it is verbally inspired. I'm not going to ask you to turn up many of these verses, so if you want to jot them down, this would be some good reading at home. You will find that many of the writers of the Bible, in other words, the people whom God inspired to write, say so themselves. They actually state things like, and the words of God were in my mouth. And the word of the Lord came unto me. And such statements are repeated again and again and again throughout their writings. Now this is not a commonplace thing. You don't pick up the average book and it says, Oh, and God spoke through me. But the Bible has writers who say and testify in their own writings many times at the very beginning of their books. It says, And the word of the Lord came to Amos. In other words, God inspired him. God's words came to him and he began to write the revelation that God had shown him. So we believe the verbal inspiration of the Bible. So remember the reasons for the full inspiration. These are the reasons for the verbal inspiration, every word, because the writers themselves say so. God gave me the words. And that's a pretty good testimony, isn't it? Those that are in the Bible that have written it say themselves, God gave me the words. But there are other reasons, and there are many, but I'll just mention a few more. The writers often did not understand what they were writing. Now, we've just read 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12, and in that, those verses it actually told us that these individuals were prophesying about a salvation that was for you and I. They knew nothing about it. They had no idea that Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, would come and die at, at Calvary for our sins. But they prophesied about these things. In Daniel, if you remember, Daniel actually writes... In fact, let's look that one up, if you will. Just turn it up with me, just quickly, to show you Daniel's own testimony. And he tells you, straight out, that he does not understand what he's writing. Have a look at this. Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 8 and 9. And he says this, it says, And I heard, and I understood not. So he heard from God, and he wrote words that he could not comprehend. I heard, and I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Here's one example where Daniel wrote words he could not comprehend, and he had no idea what they meant, but he wrote what God showed him to write. You and I have those same words, and we can comprehend from our end, because we can see the fulfillment of those prophecies. So another reason why we believe in the full verbal inspiration is that some of the times the writers did not comprehend what they were writing. They were writing things that were totally new to them and certainly not revealed to them personally. Interestingly, if you're reading Psalm, you will find that the psalmist David describes the crucifixion. He describes the nails piercing the hands, a practice 
of putting someone to death that had not been invented yet and wasn't going to be invented until the Romans came on the scene over a thousand years later, actually. Interesting, isn't it? And yet he saw it. God showed it to him and inspired him to write about how Jesus hung a Calvary on the tree. How that his, the nails would pierce his hands and how his side would be pierced with a spear. These things were inspired of God and the very words, things that he could not have foreseen were actually inspired of the Lord verbally uh, another reason why we believe in the in the verbal inspiration is that God's word seems to place importance at times on things that you and I possibly wouldn't necessarily place a great deal of importance sometimes simple words you read some in Haggai there are many such examples you could make a huge list here but this is just to give you an idea simple words are, are spoken and, and actually written down to convey truth in other instances the tense of a verb i'm sure you're well familiar with john 8:58. remember when jesus said who do you seek and they said jesus of nazareth and what did he reply i am, I am. hang on uh, that's not quite what you would say or if you remember when the the jews or the pharisees were arguing and uh, about jesus and who he was and he said before abraham was I am. Well, you know, in, in a grammatical sense, that's not really good grammar, is it? What would you say if you said, before Abraham was, I was? That's what you would say. But that's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying, he is the great I am. Before Abraham was, I existed. I was the ever-existing one. He was presenting to them the deity that they did not believe in. And so the tense of the word is so important because it reflects the truth that God is trying to communicate. Can you see that? And that's important. At times, even a mere letter can make a difference. In Galatians 3.16, let's turn that one up quickly. It actually states it quite clearly. One letter to make a plural makes a difference there. Please, Sister Jen, out loud. Praise the Lord. Okay. If you, if you read it carefully, you, you understand that the Apostle Paul to the Galatians here is making the difference between the plural and the singular. So just one letter here is emphatically uh, uh, emphasized in the Scriptures because just one letter is making the difference in the meaning of what God is communicating. After all, seeds, seeds, you know, kind of the same thing. But not so when you're communicating biblical truth. And he explains, he says, now, not of seeds that is of many, but as of one seed, that is to say, thy seed which is Christ. And so he gives us an understanding, an interpretation of what the scripture is talking about. So in all of these reasons, and for all these reasons, we believe that the word of God was verbally inspired because a mere tense could make a difference. Just a simple letter would make a difference. Jesus said, a jot or tittle will not pass away. You can't even change that. The way you cross a T or, or dot an I. That's how relevant and important the Word of God is and how precisely inspired it is of God. It is so precise, in fact, we're talking in the regional languages that it was inspired of God, that not only the words can, or even a letter cannot be changed in position or left out or what have you, but there is also a numerical pattern underlying all the words, which is so intricate and so precise that it is just mind-boggling. And, uh, and that is a study in itself. In any case, I guess all I'm trying to show you today is some of the reasons wh why we believe in verbal inspiration. As you can see, there is plenty there. And uh, here's another one. The science of the Bible is correct. When I said this one to one fellow once, he said to me, oh, yeah, right. So the Bible talks about sunrise and sunset, and you tell me that's scientifically correct? Because the sun doesn't rise and doesn't set. I said, well, that's true. But how do you describe the fact that in the morning the sun goes up or it appears to go up and goes down? What do you call it? In fact, have a look at this newspaper. At the time we had one on, on the table there and I said, look what it says. Sunrise this morning at 5.15. <laughs> so even the newspaper refers to it as that because it's a terminology that describes what is happening. Okay? The Bible doesn't present itself as a book of science, but in those things that it does mention, there is a proof and evidence that it is scientifically correct. All right, very quickly then, the testimony of Christ proves that the Bible was verbally inspired. And again, those verses that we have read, Jesus himself said it many a time. So, 
here is the question that you can ask anyone who wants to query the or any Christian that says that they can't depend on the Word of God. Well, or they say it's not necessarily divine. Well, if the Bible is part divine and part human, then which part is which? Either it's all divine or it's how you believe any of it. Either we believe it implicitly as all being inspired of God or we've got serious problems believing any of it. You know the old saying, Jesus is either Lord of all or is not Lord at all. It's the same with the Word of God. Either it's Word of God, all of it, all of it inspired as it, as it states categorically or it simply is not the Word of God. This is Psalms 119 and verse 89 and you can read that as you stand with me tonight. Uh, I've kept you for the amount of time that I've determined. Forever, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Let the scorners scorn, let those that want to be unbelievers point a finger. But one day these very books will be opened and from these very pages judgments will be drawn because the word of God is forever settled in heaven. God has said that. God's word states it. And it is his word that one day will judge us. Will you stand with me? Praise God. We have discussed tonight a little bit about how God's word is written. I pray that you've taken something you can carry home in your heart and can strengthen your faith.